Hello. Um, right, what chapter are we on? 19. Setting free the freaks. So, um, at, du at Dunloir Harbour in Dublin, two long barriers have been erected on either side of the road. To the left, a crowd of about 200 people, freakophiles all, were waiting to see the extraordinary creatures who had made their way across the ocean. Opposite them stood a much smaller crowd, a quarter of the size, made up mostly of students who waved placards in the air. Let the freaks go, said one. Ireland says no to the captivity of freaks, said a second. Stop calling them freaks, they're just ordinary people like you and me, albeit with slightly different physical characteristics and in one case a most unusual manner of speaking, said a third. Elbow boy, who didn't appear to understand how to make the most of his protest. Both groups fell silent when a door was flung open on deck and Captain Hosen appeared looking resplendent in his freshly pressed ringmaster's outfit. A funeral black hat on his head, his whip locked carefully into the pouch at his side. As he set foot on dry land, he indicated that the guard eye might allow the television reporter and cameraman through for, for a short interview. Captain Hosen, said a smartly dressed woman, thrusting a microphone between them. Miriam O'Callaghan, RTE News. There's a large crowd gathered here today in protest at what they see as the forced imprisonment of freaks. How do you respond to this accusation? With a sarcastic reply, of course, said Captain Hosen, smiling at her, and a patronising aside to remark on your extraordinary beauty. Although this is hardly a large crowd, dear lady, the large crowd will be the one that gathers to see our wonderful performances over the next week. That crowd will put this crowd to shame. A lot of people feel that this form of forced servitude is genuinely unacceptable, continued Miriam. Do you have anything to say to your critics? I make a point of never listening to my critics, said Captain Hosen, spreading his arms wide again, once again in a magnanimous gesture. I find that they give me indigestion. But all these students have taken time off from their studies. My dear Miss O'Callaghan, do you really think that's what they'd be doing if they weren't here today? Let's be honest, if it wasn't for me, they'd be protesting about something else. The latest war, the price of alcohol, giving women the vote, something like that. Captain Hosen, here in Ireland, women already have the vote. Do they indeed? What a very progressive nation you are. So you have no message for all these people who want to see the freaks set free? Actually, I have four words, replied Captain Hosen with a smile. Over my dead body. And I have a wonderful new specimen that I picked up in Toronto only last week. A very interesting little fellow disobeys the law of gravity. Little boys can be terribly disobedient at times cried one mother from behind the railings, looking down at her son, who stared back at her with an angry expression on his face. They can be a curse. They can indeed, madam, replied Captain Hosen. They can indeed, but fortunately this boy is kept in a cage, so the public is perfectly safe. And for only 100 of your devalued Irish euros, you can view him for four nights in your capital city, Dublin, and three more in the town of Skibirin, in the People's Republic of Cork. Check press for details. Until then, ladies and gentlemen, I bid you all good day. And with that, he made his way towards the front of a lorry as the last of the freak's cages were loaded onto the back. Before he could climb aboard, an elderly man rushed forward to shake his hand, locking him in a fierce embrace. And it took three guard eye to pull him away. A little shaken, Captain Hosen brushed himself down and was driven off into the Dublin afternoon. It sounded like there were some people on our side back there, said Francis, as the lorry made its way through the city. They can't save us, said Liam. No one can. The man's a monster said Delilah. Tyrant despicable, eh? added Felicia. Thirty minutes later, 
the lorry came to a halt and the back doors were thrown open. A team of men were waiting for them, each wearing bright red polo shirts and yellow chinos. And they carried the cages into a specially constructed porter cabin where they looked at each freak with interest, particularly Jeremy, the boy with the flippers where his feet should have been. You must be a great swimmer yourself, are you? asked one of them. Your remark is both insensitive and ignorant, replied Jeremy. And you must be the new arrival, said another, looking at Barnaby, who was lying flat against the top of his cage. Look at you, you're floating. Barnaby stared at him and thought about happier times, like the day Captain W.E. Johns kicked a football past Henry into the goal in their back garden. Ah, don't you look so... Don't look so miserable, said the man. We've put something very special in here, just for you. Inside the porter cabin, Barnaby was astonished to see that a mattress had been nailed to the ceiling in the corner, just like Alistair had done when he was a baby. The very sight of it made him long for home. Is it a David Jones Bellissimo plush medium mattress? He asked hopefully. No, it's from the Argos economy line, replied the man, releasing the boy from his cage but it should do the trick. What a curious place, said Francis, when they were alone, gazing out at the mansion where the President of Ireland lived. Look over there, said Delilah, pointing at the big top, which had been constructed in the centre of the park, with a sign that proclaimed freakitude. It was surrounded by caricatures of various strange-looking individuals, none of whom bore any resemblance to the people currently being held captive. That's where they'll parade us like, like, like freaks, said Jeremy, sitting down in the corner and burying his face in his flippers. Later that night, however, after dinner, some, something unexpected took place. Captain Hosen had been invited to dine with the president, who was intending to give him a stern lecture in two languages on how much he disapproved of what he was doing, and the freaks were gathered in the corner of the room playing cards, with Barnaby watching the action from above and trying not to shout out when he saw that someone had a particularly good hand. It was in the middle of a game of poker that they heard a curious scraping sound coming from the keyhole. What's that? asked Jeremy in fright. They made their way back to their respective cages as the scraping continued until finally the lock gave way and the door was flung open to reveal an elderly man. The same man who had thrown himself at Captain Hosen earlier in the day. Hell's bells, cried the man triumphantly. I did it. Who are you? asked Liam McGonagall. Shh, keep your voices down, he said, poking his head back out of the door and looking around nervously. Is everyone here? Everyone who? asked Barnaby. Everyone from the show. Everyone they call freaks, he added, looking a little embarrassed as he said the word. We're not performing for you now, if that's what you're hoping for, said the first Siamese twin. Pay your money tomorrow night like everyone else, said the second. I don't want to see the show, said the man. I've come to see you free. To set us free? asked Francis, standing up. To set us free? asked Jeremy, flapping his flippers. Free us set to? asked Felicia, putting her hands to her mouth in delight. I read all about you in the paper, said the man. And hell's bells, I said to myself, that's just completely wrong. Nobody should be kept in captivity like this. You need to be able to go home to your families, but we need to keep our voices down. There might be more security people around here. We can't let them hear us. There's half a dozen outside somewhere, said Jeremy. They've been there since we arrived this afternoon. Well, they're not there anymore, replied the man, laughing heartily as he held up an empty bottle in front of them. The same bottle that Captain Hosen had offered to Barnaby when he took him inside the Toronto Tower. I stole this from that awful man earlier. Then I gave some to each of the guards. They should be out for the rest of the night. You managed to get them all to drink from that little bottle? Asked Francis in surprise. No, I bought a big box of doughnuts and sprinkled some of the water on top, he explained. That's not water, said Barnaby. Well, whatever it is, the point is they're out for the count. And if you want to get out of this place, now's your chance. You want to go home, don't you? I do, said Barnaby quickly. I'm trying to get back to Sydney. Let's save the chitter-chatter for later, said the man. We need to get going. 
He opened the door and looked left and right. You better jump on my back, he said to Barnaby. We can't have you floating away. The rest of you follow on behind. Barnaby did as he was told. And a few minutes later, the entire troop was making its way through Phoenix Park in the moonlight. Two stags appeared in their path, stared at them for a moment, confused by the flippers, hooks, and as there was a lot of pollen in the air, the woman who kept appearing and disappearing every few seconds. But in the end, simply bowed their antlers and took off in the opposite direction. In the distance, parked along the road, was a small fleet of cars and motorbikes. I bought all these earlier today, said the man, chucking, chuckling away to himself. Hell's bells, I have so much money it wasn't any problem at all. The students are going to take each of you in a different direction, so you'd better say your goodbyes now. That way it will be harder to track you down. We'll be heading for bus terminals, train stations, airports and harbours. If you travel together, you'll stand out from the crowd too much. Which Barnaby thought was what had got them into this situation in the first place. The friends all said goodbye to each other, promising to write once they got where they were going. Some of them had been together a long time, and although they were looking forward to going home, they were very sorry to be leaving the others behind. It was good seeing you again, said Liam McGonagall, offering his hook to Barnaby, who shook it warmly. Where will you go? he asked. Back to India, if I can make my way there. I hope we meet again some day. Well, we didn't expect to meet this time, so you never know. Safe home, Barnaby. They sped off in different directions until there were only two people left by the final motorbike. You haven't told me your name yet, said Barnaby to the man who had saved them. Stanley Grout, he said, and you'd better hold tight or you'll go shooting off into the night sky. These bikes go pretty fast, you know. Barnaby did as he was told and locked his arms around Stanley's waist. Where are we going anyway? He shouted in his ear as they pulled out. The airport, he roared back. And 20 minutes later, they were abandoning the bike in the car park. I bought a couple of tickets earlier, he said. To Sydney? No, sorry. I didn't realise that was where you'd want to go. I'm on my way to Africa, so you'll have to come too, I'm afraid. But we can get you back to Australia once we arrive there, which was good enough for Barnaby. They went up the escalator towards departures, Barnaby clinging on to Stanley's back again, as he didn't have any other way of staying on the ground. I'm too old for this, said Stanley, a few minutes later, setting the boy down. How are you going to keep you, you how are we going to keep you from floating away? Rucksacks the best, explained Barnaby, filled with heavy items. I put them on my back and they keep me grounded. Bear with me two seconds, I just need to do something with my cat. Come on. There we go, sorry, he, le he keeps trying to get on the bed where he's not allowed. Right, um, doo -doo -doo. Uh, rucksacks are best, filled with heavy items. Right, says Stanley, leading the way to the shops where he bought one, along with eight litre bottles of water, which they packed into the rucksack before strapping it onto Barnaby's back. And a few minutes later, Barnaby and Stanley were making their way down the gangway, boarding passes in hand. They found their seats where they quickly fell asleep. And when they woke up again, they were already in Africa. Wow, there you go. So Barnaby is going all over the world, isn't he? So he's been in... Where's he been? He started in Australia, Brazil, Canada, Ireland, and now he's in Africa. So we'll find out what happens next when we read our next chapter. That's it for now.